The phenomenon of length contraction is an indispensable element of the theory of relativity. But is the contraction of physical objects even real? And if so, what actually causes it? The theory of special relativity is notoriously ambiguous on this subject. But we'll find that by drawing a little inspiration from other contemporary theories, we can begin to piece together a solution to one of the longest standing mysteries in modern physics. Plus, uncover a whole lot more. This is Dialect with How Superposition Causes Length Contraction. There's something almost magical that happens to the electric field of a point charge when it's set in uniform motion. No, it's not that the field lines become squished in towards the transverse direction, and as such the field ends up looking like a pancake, though this will become very important in a second. Rather, it's that these field lines actually wind up moving perfectly in step with the charge. Think about it for a moment. This is totally bizarre. One of the core ideas of modern physics is that information can't travel faster than the speed of light. So how could the field lines of a charge know to become instantaneously translated along with that charge itself? How does this field vector here, for instance, know how to always point towards the precise location of the charge and with the appropriate magnitude? despite that information clearly needing time to travel from the charge to that field point. Indeed, one would rather expect a clear delay between a charge's movement through its electric field and the altering of that field itself. Something ultimately that should wind up looking like this. And although we do observe such delays when charges are accelerated, Strangely, we don't observe them when charges are moving at uniform velocity. Instead, all we observe is just the perfectly co-moving pancake field. This strange fact is often cited as proof of the postulate of relativity. That is, the assertion that there is no physical difference between a frame at rest and a frame in uniform motion. Indeed, it's argued that if we transform into the moving charge's frame, we can treat both the charge and its field as being at rest. Therefore, the field and charge must always remain synchronized for any inertial movement. But there's a huge ambiguity in this argument, because there is an important physical difference between the frame of a charge at rest and the frame of a charge in uniform motion which is precisely the aforementioned pancaking of its electric field. Indeed, it's this pancaking which is responsible for one of the most famous phenomena in all of relativity. The phenomenon of length contraction. To see why, simply place a charge in the moving field at a contracted distance of L times 1 over gamma out from the source along the line of motion and calculate the force it would feel there. Turns out, that force is the exact same as the force it would feel at a distance L out from a charge at rest. This is because the electric field of a moving charge gets reduced by a factor of 1 over gamma squared along the axis of movement, hence causing its pancake shape. And so to offset this shrinking, we must move the charge in closer by a factor of 1 over gamma. Doing this indeed, we see the 1 over gamma gets squared in the denominator of the inverse square portion of the modified electric field equation, and cancels with the 1 over gamma squared in its numerator. Leaving simply the force the charge would feel at a distance L out if the field were at rest. Thank you. 
This here provides us the only physical explanation we could ever possibly need for length contraction, which is of course that intermolecular bonds are weakened by motion, and hence must be moved in closer to one another to retain their original configurations. But still, this explanation leaves a number of unanswered questions. Why does the electric field get pancaked in the first place? And moreover, how is it that the moving field manages to stay synchronized with its charge? This is where most physicists and teachers simply throw up their hands and say, well, that's the magic of relativity. The synchronization occurs because uniformly moving frames are somehow the same physically as at-rest frames, with the exception of the field pancaking, which occurs because space itself is relative and somehow mysteriously contracts. But science is not magic, nor should it be reduced to it. And as we've explored in prior videos, there's actually no such thing as the contraction of space itself. Lorentzian geometry is merely a descriptive convention that results from observers always choosing to calibrate the speed of light as being isotropic in their own inertial frames. Indeed, with appropriate synchronicity choices for our clocks, we can make Lorentzian invariance entirely vanish, and along with it, any contraction of space itself. However, the contraction of physical objects does not disappear with such synchronicity choices, meaning the phenomenon of length contraction must be regarded as entirely physical, and hence as having a causal source. So everything then turns on the following question. Can the equation for the pancake field be derived without invoking any notion of relative space or time whatsoever, in some sort of mechanistic or classical manner? Well, actually, yes. And in fact, this was how it was first done, way back in the 1880s by the English physicist Oliver Heaviside. Indeed, at the time he and other physicists derived this equation through a method that invoked something called the retarded potential. But at the time, the math behind these retarded potentials was complicated and obscure, and physicists didn't know nearly enough about our microscopic world to begin approaching any real interpretation of it. Today, however, we understand our microscopic world much more completely including the very central role played within it by wave mechanics. Indeed, if there's one thing that modern quantum field theory tells us, it's that light itself performs one of the most crucial tasks in our physical world, that of communicating the electromagnetic force. But what happens if we bequeath unto force all the additional phenomena of wave mechanics? Well, with a little pluck and insight, we can now do today what physicists 130 years ago could only conjecture about and begin to account for the strange behavior of the pancake field. Oh my. Let's imagine we have a basic point charge and we want to develop a model where the forces due to this charge propagate outwards at a finite speed as waves through some sort of medium. For obvious reasons, we'll start by assuming this propagation occurs at the speed of light c. Next, we'll choose to work with potentials instead of force. This is because the electric and magnetic fields interact in complicated ways according to Maxwell's equations, and working with potentials greatly simplifies the picture. Note that there are actually two electromagnetic potentials, a scalar and a vector one. But for now, we'll only worry about the scalar one. Now, from electrostatics we know that the potential falls off spherically as 1 over r about a point charge. But we want to describe the process of how this information actually travels from the charge to the field point. To do this, let's imagine the potential field as being continuously communicated by the charge via spherical waves, whose amplitude falls off as 1 over r. 
That is, the amplitude of these waves at any point around the charge describes a scalar field, phi equals kq over r, which is precisely the electrostatic potential field of that charge. And by continuous, we mean the potential is always being refreshed in real time, as though the charge were continuously pinging its environment to communicate its location. Next, let's add a second charge to the picture. Now, the principle of superposition from electrostatics tells us that the total value of the potential at any field point is simply the sum of the potentials from each individual charge. So if these charges have the same sign, then we can recognize that these potential wave fronts everywhere constructively interfere, or add together, to produce wave fronts of greater amplitude. Now let's move one charge on top of the other. Clearly our wave fronts will overlap. But if we want each wavefront line to only represent the magnitude of a wavefront due to one charge, we can now perform a little trick by shifting the emission from the second charge so that it's out of phase with the first. Doing this allows us to model superimposed charges as being communicated via higher frequency wavefronts. Here, for instance, doubling the charge clearly doubled the frequency of emission and hence depicts a doubled potential. Okay, so with this model in mind, let's now ask, what happens if our charge is moving at a velocity v relative to the medium of propagation? Well, first, let's consider how the picture looks for just a single wavefront. The charge emits the wave, and then the wave expands spherically through the medium, while the charge moves to the right. Now, after some time t, the potential due to a single wavefront will be skewed relative to the charge. To the right, the value of the potential will be weaker than for a charge at rest, since the wavefront had longer to travel but wound up at a shorter distance from the charge. To the left, meanwhile, the value of the potential will be greater than for a charge at rest. Since the wavefront had shorter to travel, but wound up at a longer distance. Now, some simple calculations will tell us that the factor by which the potential on the right is weakened is that of 1 minus V over C. while the factor by which the potential on the left is strengthened is that of 1 plus V over C. Now, if we stopped here in our analysis, we'd expect to observe some sort of anisotropy in the potential field of a uniformly moving charge. This is because if we drew a circle of some radius R about our charge, at any given moment, there'll be some retarded wave emitted at a prior time passing through the rightmost point. But also, simultaneously, a second retarded wave emitted at a later time passing through the leftmost point. The amplitude of these two waves will not be the same, of course. Moreover, they will be related to the amplitude of the rest potential by the same retardation factors we just calculated for a single wave. Now, such an anisotropy in the potential field, if it did exist, ought to result in lagging electric and magnetic fields, like the ones we originally hypothesized. But of course, such fields are not observed. So, what's lacking from this picture then? Well, as you might have already guessed, the answer to that question is superposition. That is, if we want to analyze this problem dynamically, the most important point to remember is that our charge is continuously emitting wavefronts. What this means for charges in uniform motion is that we'll immediately observe a Doppler effect, wherein wavefronts heading in the direction of the charge's motion get piled up upon one another, while wavefronts heading in the direction opposite of the charge's motion get spread out from one another. This piling up and spreading out is nothing more, of course, than wavefront superposition. 
Indeed, recalling our frequency model from earlier, we can note that the increased frequency of wavefronts means a greater overall charge, and hence a greater overall potential, is being communicated to the field points to the right. Likewise, a decreased frequency of wavefronts means a lesser overall charge, and hence a lesser potential, is being communicated to field points on the left. We thus have to account not only for the wavefront retardations, but also for the wavefront superpositions. So again, let's pick two points at a distance r out from the charge. Now, as we already know, wavefront retardation tells us that the potential of these points must be offset from the rest potential of a charge by the corresponding 1 minus v over c and 1 plus v over c factors. But now, we recognize that, according to the equation for wavefront superposition developed earlier, each of these potentials must now also be multiplied by the corresponding frequency of wavefronts at those positions. To calculate these frequency shifts, we can simply use the well-known Doppler formula. Doing this, we see that to the right, the increased frequency of wavefronts means the potential sees an increase by a factor of 1 over 1 minus v over c. While to the left, the decreased frequency of wavefronts means the potential sees a decrease by a factor of 1 over 1 plus v over c. Do you see it now? The respective increase and decrease of superimposed potentials here exactly offsets the anisotropy which occurs due to the retardation of the signal propagation. This means our final potential field always moves exactly in step with its charge, despite the signals only ever being able to propagate at a finite speed. This, this is why there's no difference between electromagnetic fields in uniform motion and those at rest because these two phenomena precisely cancel each other out for any sort of uniform motion. Meaning, we've actually derived the principle of relativity here, rather than postulating it as an axiom, as special relativity is forced to do. We don't know about you, but to us, this is absolutely mind-blowing. One of the most ancient mysteries of physics is slowly being revealed as having its roots in wave mechanics. Of course, there's still the remaining physical difference of the field pancaking, which we can now understand by considering how the potential of the moving charge is affected along the transverse direction. As before, let's start by considering a single wavefront. Here we see that as the charge moves, this wavefront has further to travel, but winds up at a shorter distance out from the charge. Hence, signal retardation requires the potential is weakened there with respect to a charge at rest. As some quick math shows, this weakening occurs by the factor of 1 over gamma. Next, we examine the Doppler shift along the path traveled by the retarded wavefront and observe that there is an increase in frequency there, which occurs by a factor of gamma squared. The total transverse field strength is thus increased by a factor of gamma. We can hence see that, in the transverse case, there's no back-and-forth symmetry like with the longitudinal case. And so the final equipotential surface winds up looking ellipsoidal, pancaked. Now, we need to repeat this whole process for the electromagnetic vector potential. But the procedure is essentially the same as for the scalar potential. Once equipped with the general solutions for these two potentials, we can then use them to calculate both the electric and magnetic fields. And boom, out pops our pancake fields. And that's it. That's all you need to derive the behavior of moving electromagnetic fields. Relative space and time become entirely superfluous and ad hoc here. 
What's incredible, of course, is that this use of retarded potentials dates all the way back to Heaviside. And even today, you can find a variety of authors utilizing it to demonstrate how both length contraction and time dilation can be derived in a completely classical fashion. However, no one seems to have ever explicitly put this sort of dynamical wave interpretation upon it, despite the fact that it renders the mathematics almost immediately intelligible. So, is that it then? Do we get to hang up our hats and declare we have solved the mysteries of relativity? That we have both derived the principle of relativity and uncovered the mechanism behind length contraction? Well, not quite yet, because there are two lingering issues at hand. The first is that to fully derive the principle of relativity, we can't just demonstrate it for electromagnetic fields like we've done here. We also have to demonstrate that it holds for Newton's laws as well. Secondly, there's the issue that, when we examine the strength of moving electric and magnetic fields in the transverse direction, we'll find the total electromagnetic force a charge feels is not equal to the total electric force it would feel at the same distance out at rest. This suggests, of course, that something is askew in our length contraction model. But this is because there is still one very important piece missing from the picture. A piece that, once put into place, will resolve both these issues in one fell swoop. And that is the piece of relativistic mass. Indeed, will this last pillar of relativity hold strong against our classical-minded scrutiny? Or is there perhaps some other feature of wave mechanics that might explain it? Place your bets now, because the remaining mysteries of relativity may not be mysteries for much longer. This has been Dialect. As always, stay tuned.